new technology will make it possible to treat HIV with one injection. New research from Tel Aviv University points to a unique treatment for HIV-infected people that could be used as a vaccine or a one-off treatment for patients. As part of the work, the researchers reprogrammed the patient's lymphocytes to secrete HIV-neutralizing antibodies. The study was led by Dr. Adi Basel and PhD student Alessio Nermad, both from the George S. Y School of Neurobiology, Biochemistry and Biophysics in the Life Sciences Department, and the Dotan Center for Advanced Therapies in collaboration with the Suriski Medical Center, Ichilov. The results of the work were presented in the journal, Nature Biotechnology. Over the past two decades, the lives of many AIDS patients have improved with treatments that have transformed the disease from a fatal to a chronic one. However, we still have a long way to go to find a cure for HIV. Dr. Basel's laboratory is working on a one-time injection that could help treat the disease in the future. The new technique uses B lymphocytes, a group of granulocytes called leukocytes that have been genetically engineered to secrete HIV-neutralizing antibodies. B lymphocytes are responsible for producing antibodies against viruses, bacteria and other diseases. They are formed in the bone marrow. Upon reaching maturity, they move into the blood and lymphatic system, and from there to various parts of the body. Dr. Basel explains that, so far, only a few scientists have been able to modify lymphocytes outside the body. In the new study, we were the first to do this inside the body and make these cells produce the desired antibodies, he says. Such a treatment is possible thanks to special viral vectors that have been designed so that they do not cause damage, but only introduce the appropriate gene encoding antibodies to cells in the body. Furthermore, in this case, we were able to precisely insert the antibodies into the desired site of the B-cell. All the animals treated with the drug reacted and had large amounts of the desired antibody in their blood. We also produced antibodies from their blood and made sure that they were actually effective at neutralizing HIV in a laboratory dish. Genome editing was performed using the CRISPR-Cas9 technique. It is a technology based on the bacterial immune system against viruses. Bacteria use CRISPR systems as a sort of molecular searcher to locate viral sequences and cleave them for disposal. The two biochemists who discovered this sophisticated defense mechanism, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, were able to redirect it to cut DNA at will. Since then, technology has been used to turn off unwanted genes or fix and insert desirable genes. Doudna and Charpentier gained international recognition when they won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. We combine the ability of CRISPR to deliver genes where desired with the capabilities of viral carriers to carry genes into cells, explained study co-author Alessio Nermad. In this way, we are able to engineer B cells in the patient's body. We use two viral carriers, one of which encodes the desired antibody and the other encodes the CRISPR system. When CRISPR crosses the desired site, it also directs the insertion of the desired gene. This gene encodes antibodies against the HIV virus, he explains. Scientists explain that there is currently no genetic cure for AIDS, so the research opportunities are huge. We have developed an innovative treatment that can defeat the virus with a single injection, which can bring a huge improvement in patients' health. When the modified cells come into contact with the virus, the pathogen stimulates them to divide, so we use the very cause of the disease to fight it, Dr. Basel concludes. Furthermore, if the virus changes, 
The B cells will also change accordingly to fight it. So we have created the first ever drug that can evolve in the body and defeat viruses in an arms race. Based on this research, we can expect that in the coming years we will be able to produce a cure for AIDS, for other infectious diseases and for some types of cancers caused by viruses, such as cervical cancer, head and neck cancer and others, concludes the scientist. Eavesdropping method using light bulbs. Israeli scientists have developed a new, extremely sophisticated method of eavesdropping. Researchers have proven that to learn the content of conversations in a room several dozen meters away, all you need is an ordinary light bulb installed there and cheap. Easily available electronic equipment. Eavesdropping techniques are constantly evolving. Researchers from Israel's Ben-Gurion University and the Weizmann Institute of Science have revealed another method they call, Lamphone. Unlike many other similar techniques, this one requires no access to the monitored room, no microphones or lasers to betray the spy, and can be used in real time. All you need is a light bulb. The scientists admitted that their method does not require large financial outlays and the whole set can be easily obtained. All you need is a laptop with sound processing software, a small telescope, and a $400 electro-optical sensor. Thanks to this, you can eavesdrop on sounds in a room several dozen meters away in real time. Observing barely perceptible vibrations on the glass surface of the bulb caused by voices or music in the eavesdropped room. By measuring these small changes, the researchers proved that a spy could pick up sound clearly enough to recognize the content of conversations or recognize a piece of music being played in a room. Every sound in the room can be recovered without having to hack anything. The presence of any spying devices in the listening room is also not required, says Ben Nasi of Ben Gurion University, who, together with other researchers, Yaron Perutin and Boris Zadov, developed the new technique. You only need to have a clear view of the light bulb in the room. That's all, he adds. We show how fluctuations in air pressure on the surface of a hanging bulb in response to sound, cause the bulb to vibrate slightly. This can be used by spies to passively eavesdrop on conversations in real time, the researchers admitted in their publication. The tiny vibrations of the bulb in response to the sounds were recorded as measurable changes in the light, which were picked up by their sensor, Forlabs PDA 100A2, on the telescope. Then the signal was converted from analog to digital. The researchers also used noise-canceling software. They also used Google Cloud Speech API speech recognition programs as well as applications that recognize various music tracks, such as Shazam. It was enough to overhear what was going on in the room. The research team carried out the test by pointing a telescope on a bridge at a light bulb in an apartment building 27 meters away. By picking up the vibrations of the light bulb, they were able to recognize the music playing in the room. It was, Let It Be, by The Beatles and, Clocks, by Coldplay. They also recognized a fragment of the speech of US President Donald Trump. However, scientists have admitted that a lampshade on a light bulb or curtains on a window is enough to stop the method from being effective. In their tests, the researchers used a hanging bulb. And it's not clear if a bulb mounted in a floor lamp or ceiling fixture vibrates enough to produce the same type of signal. In addition, in the room overheard during the test, both the music and Trump's speech were played at maximum volume, much louder than normal conversation. Although with more expensive and more sensitive equipment, it could be possible to eavesdrop on quiet conversations.
Researchers working on the new technique swear that their goal is not to provide intelligence with new tools, but only to make people aware that these types of attacks are possible. Animals change their shapes in response to global warming. Climate change is not just a human problem. Animals also have to adapt to this. The effect of warming is that some species are getting bigger beaks, legs and ears, a new study suggests. All to better regulate body temperature as the planet gets hotter. Some animal species change their physiology to adapt to warmer climates. These changes include the appearance of larger and larger beaks, legs and ears to better regulate body temperature. These metamorphoses were described in a review published in Trends in Ecology and Evolution by Sarah Riding from Deakin University in Australia. It's about time we understood that animals also need to adapt to climate change, but on a much shorter time scale than has been the case for most of evolutionary time, says Riding. The climate change we have created is putting tremendous pressure on animals. Some species will adapt, others won't. Riding notes that climate change is a complex and multifaceted phenomenon that happens gradually, so it's hard to pinpoint just one cause of shape change among some animals. However, these changes occur across many geographical regions and across a wide variety of species, and climate change is the only factor common to the cases studied. A strong shape change was noted especially in birds. Several species of Australian parrots have shown an increase in beak size of between 4 and 10 percent on average since 1871, which is correlated with the summer temperature each year. Among North American small sparrow-sized junco birds, Researchers have noted an association between increased beak size and short-term extreme heat in cold regions. But changes also apply to mammals. The researchers noted an increase in tail length in wood mouse mice and an increase in tail and leg length in arctic shrews. It has also been shown that bats living in increasingly warmer climates have larger wings. The increase we have seen so far is quite small, less than 10%. So the changes are unlikely to be noticeable right away. However, some parts of the body, such as the ears, are predicted to increase in size, says Riding. When it's hot, birds use their beaks to dissipate heat, and mammals use their ears to dissipate heat. Some creatures in warmer climates have historically evolved to have larger beaks or ears to shed heat more easily. These differences become more pronounced as the climate warms. If animals do not control their body temperature, they can overheat and die. The beaks, which are not covered with feathers and therefore not insulated, are the site of significant heat transfer. As are the ears, tails, and legs of mammals if they are not covered with dense fur. Elevated temperatures associated with climate change are likely to affect thermoregulatory demands on animals. Among other things, temperature increases experienced as part of climate change may result in the selection of larger body parts that facilitate efficient heat dissipation, the authors wrote in the paper. Riding now aims to study shape variation in Australian birds by scanning 3D museum bird specimens from the last 100 years. This will help her team better understand which birds are changing sizes and shapes due to climate change. Shape shifting does not mean that animals are coping with climate change and that everything is fine. It just means they evolved to survive it. But we're not sure what the other ecological ramifications of these changes are and whether all species are capable of changing and surviving, says Riding. The drunk monkey hypothesis. New findings may explain people's fondness for alcohol. Why are people so drawn to alcohol?
Some clues to the evolutionary origin of this propensity can be found in the behavior of certain Panamanian monkeys. The attraction to percentages may have been inherited from our ape ancestors. According to new research, and stems from primates' deep-seated taste for ethanol naturally found in ripe fruit. For 25 years, a biologist at the University of California at Berkeley, Robert Dudley, has been intrigued by people's love of alcohol. In 2014, he wrote a book proposing that our attraction to liquor originated millions of years ago when monkeys discovered that the smell of alcohol indicated ripe, fermenting, and nutritious fruit. New research supports what Dudley himself calls the drunk monkey hypothesis. The research was led by primatologist Professor Christina Campbell of California State University, CSUN, and her student Victoria Weaver. The researchers collected fruits eaten and discarded by the black-handed clinging monkey, Ateles Jeffroy, in Panama. The researchers found that the alcohol concentration in the fruit ranged from 1 to 2 percent. Volume. Ethanol is produced in them as a result of natural fermentation. Moreover, the researchers collected the urine of the monkeys and found that it contained secondary metabolites of alcohol. This result proves that the animals actually digested the alcohol and used it for energy production. For the first time, we have been able to demonstrate beyond doubt that wild primates consume ethanol containing fruit without human intervention, said Campbell. More research needs to be done, she says. But, it appears that the drunken monkey hypothesis may be true, and that people's tendency to consume alcohol stems from fruit-eating primates' deep-rooted preference for ethanol naturally found in ripe fruit. The study was published in the journal Royal Society Open Science. Dudley provided evidence to support his idea eight years ago in The Drunken Monkey, Why We Drink and Abuse Alcohol. Studies have shown that some fruits known to be eaten by primates are naturally high in alcohol, as high as 7%. However, at the time, Dudley had no evidence that the monkeys specifically sought out and ate the fermented fruit, or that they digested the alcohol contained in it. In a newly described study, researchers from CSUN, in collaboration with Dudley and University of California at Berkeley graduate student Alexi Morrow, analyzed the alcohol content of the fruit. Morrow is conducting parallel research on the alcohol content of the fruit diets of chimpanzees in Uganda and Côte d'Ivoire. This study is a test of the drunk monkey hypothesis, said Dudley. A biology professor at the University of California, Berkeley. First, there is ethanol in the diet of monkeys, and they eat a lot of fruit. Second, they metabolize alcohol. And secondary metabolites such as ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate appear in their urine. We still don't know how much alcohol animals consume and what the possible behavioral and physiological effects are. But we have confirmation of the hypothesis, says the scientist. The research took place in the field, on the island of Barro, Colorado in Panama where Dudley first began to consider the role of ethanol in the diet of animals and the relationship to our tastes and alcohol abuse. The researchers found that the fruit that the black-handed spider monkeys sniffed and bit had an alcohol concentration of between 1 and 2 percent, about half that of low-alcohol beers. The harvested ripe fruit was the main component of the monkey's diet and came from a tree called the momban plum, Spondius momban, also known as the jobo tree. For millennia, these fruits have been used by indigenous peoples in Central and South America to make chicha, a fermented alcoholic beverage. The researchers also collected urine from six monkeys. 
five samples contained secondary ethanol metabolites. Monkeys probably eat fruit with ethanol because of the calories, says Campbell. They got more calories from fermented fruit than from unfermented ones. More calories means more energy. Dudley doubts that monkeys feel the intoxicating effects of alcohol that humans know. They probably don't get drunk because their intestines fill up before they get drunk, he explains. Eating fermented fruit may have some physiological benefits. Perhaps such food has an antibacterial effect, and the activity of yeast and microbes may help digest the fruit. It cannot be ruled out, says the expert. Human ancestors may have also preferentially selected ethanol-containing fruits for consumption because they have more calories, said Dudley Campbell. The psychoactive and hedonistic effects of ethanol consumption may result in increased consumption, he adds. Alcohol is now available in liquid form, without the gut-filling pulp of fermentable fruit, meaning it's easy to overdo it. The idea that humans' natural inclination for alcohol was inherited from our ancestors could help society cope with the negative effects of alcohol abuse. Researchers have discovered a link between the immune system and hair growth. When the immune system attacks the hair follicles, it causes hair loss. But thanks to new research, experts understand better how immune cells called regulatory T cells interact with skin cells, using the hormone as a messenger to generate new follicles and hair growth. How regulatory T cells reduce excessive immune responses in autoimmune diseases has been studied for a long time, says the author of the paper, Professor Yi Zheng from the Nomis Center for Immunobiology and Microbial Pathogenesis in Seoul. Now we've been able to identify the hormonal signal and growth factor that actually promote hair growth and repair, completely independent of the suppression of the immune response, he explains. Researchers initially did not focus on their hair loss research. They were interested in accurately characterizing the role of regulatory T cells, TREGs, and glucocorticoid hormones in autoimmune diseases. Glucocorticoid hormones are cholesterol-derived steroid hormones produced by the adrenal glands and other tissues. First, they studied how these components of the immune system function in multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease and asthma. The researchers found that glucocorticoids and TREGs did not act in a significant way in either of these conditions. They therefore decided to observe environments where Treg cells exhibit particularly high levels of glucocorticoid receptors, responsive to glucocorticoid hormones, such as skin tissue. Therefore, they caused hair loss in mice. After two weeks, we saw a clear difference between the mice. The hair grew back in the control animals, unlike those without glucocorticoid receptors says lead author Ji Lu of Zheng's lab. It was very striking and showed us the right direction to take next. The results suggest that there must be some kind of communication between regulatory T cells and hair follicle stem cells that allows hair to regenerate. Using various techniques to monitor cellular communication, scientists tested how regulatory T cells and glucocorticoid receptors in skin tissue behave. They found that glucocorticoids tell TREGs to activate hair follicle stem cells, leading to hair growth. This interaction between TREGs and stem cells depends on the mechanism by which glucocorticoid receptors induce TGF-beta-3 protein production within T cells. TGF-beta-3 then activates hair follicle stem cells to divide into new hair follicles, which promotes hair growth. 
Additional analyzers confirmed that this pathway is completely independent of the ability of Tregs to maintain immune balance. However, Treg cells do not normally produce TGF beta 3 as was the case here. When scientists searched databases, they found that this phenomenon occurs in damaged muscle and heart tissues. In severe cases of alopecia, immune cells attack the skin tissue, causing hair loss. Typically, glucocorticoids are used to suppress the immune response in the skin so that the cells do not attack the hair follicles, says Sheng. The use of glucocorticoids has a double benefit. It stimulates Treg cells in the skin to produce TGF-beta-3, stimulating the activation of hair follicle stem cells, he explains. This study revealed that Treg cells and glucocorticoid hormones are not only immunosuppressants, but also have a regenerative function. Next, the researchers will look at other injury models and isolate Treg cells from damaged tissues to monitor increased levels of TGF-beta-3 and other growth factors.